Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, Namaskaram. I am Dr. Gunapriya Raghunath, Professor and Head, Department of Anatomy, Savita Medical College and Hospital, Chennai. In today's session, we will be discussing about shoulder joint, one of the most important joints in the human body. So, what you are seeing here in the picture is a shoulder joint where you can see the scapula, the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the articulating hemispherical head of the humerus. Let us move on to the topic now. The objectives of this session. At the end of this session, the student should be able to describe the shoulder joint under the following headings. Type, articular surfaces, ligaments, relations, bursae around the joint, movements and muscles producing them, blood supply, innovation and clinical anatomy. Moving on to a clinical problem, a 54 year old man fell down from the stairs following which he developed excruciating pain over his right shoulder and was unable to move his affected shoulder. He was taken to the emergency room where he was examined and was subjected to x-ray which revealed loss of contour of his right shoulder. He was sitting in ER with his left hand supporting his right elbow so that his right shoulder does not move and complained that there was a loss of sensation in the lower half of deltoid region. Any attempt to move his injured shoulder was too painful also. What is the likely diagnosis in this case? Why does it happen? What is the most common type in such a clinical condition? What is the cause of loss of normal contour of shoulder? What is the cause for loss of sensation in the lower half of deltoid region? So we have seen the case in today's session. We are going to analyze the case, resolve it and answer the questions that follow. Let us move on to the core topic now. Introduction to shoulder joint, it is one of the most movable joints in the human body, most important joints as well. Shoulder joint is only a part of shoulder joint complex. So, shoulder joint complex includes the glenohumeral joint which is the shoulder joint, acromioclavicular joint, sternoclavicular joint and scapulothoracic articulation. So, in the picture here you can make out all the four component joints forming the complex known as shoulder joint complex. So, that is a glenohumeral joint which is otherwise commonly known as shoulder joint. So, this is acromioclavicular joint, sternoclavicular joint and scapulothoracic articulation. So, in today's session we are going to discuss only about shoulder joint per se. Before going on to the main topic of shoulder joint, let us see how it has evolved from animals to mankind. So, shoulder joint was a forelimb in quadrupeds. And then it has evolved by undergoing a large number of modifications in the process of evolution to become a very freely movable joint in the human body in the upper limb. Type, it is a synovial joint of ball and socket variety. So it is a synovial joint lined by synovial membrane on the outside covered by a fibrous capsule. So it is definitely going to be freely mobile. At the same time, there is a ball and a socket involved in the formation of this joint. The articulation you have a large round head of the humerus articulating with the shallow glenoid cavity of scapula. So if you see in the bone, this is the humerus and this is the scapula. Right humerus and the right scapula. This is the head of the humerus, glenoid cavity of the scapula. So you can just make out from the articulating ends of the bones, head of the humerus and glenoid cavity of scapula. The glenoid cavity of scapula as it appears here you can make out is very shallow. It is very shallow. If you look at the head of the humerus, it is hemispherical and nicely convex. So this joint is not actually fully congruent. What do you mean by congruency? When two articulating surfaces or joining surfaces are reciprocally concave and convex, we call that as an 
uh, congruent articulation. But whereas here, the head of the humerus is nicely convex, at the same time to fit to receive the head of the humerus, the glenoid cavity is not that highly concave. So, let us now see how the shoulder joint is articulating with the help of two bones. So, this is the head of the humerus. It has a head which is nicely hemispherical and convex. And this is the glenoid cavity of the scapula. The glenoid cavity of the scapula is not that concave, reciprocally concave to receive the head of the humerus which is convex. So, these two should articulate with each other for that congruency is an important factor. So, these two articulating surfaces are not really fully congruent with each other. So, one is highly convex and the other one is shallow, it is not deep. So, always bear in mind that this joint has a risk of getting dislocated easily. So, this is the articulation of shoulder joint. Now, let us move on further. Proximally, it is the socket that is a glenoid cavity of the scapula which is the articulating end of the shoulder joint. It is pyriform in shape or otherwise pear shaped with a slight concavity in the center. It is lined by hyaline articular cartilage and this shallow socket is further deepened by the attachment of glenoidal labrum to the margins of the glenoid cavity or fossa. Glenoidal labrum is a fibrocartilaginous ribbon which gets attached to the margins of this glenoidal fossa or cavity to further dip, deepen or increase the depth available for the head of the humerus to articulate with the glenoid fossa. Coming to distal articulating surface, it is the ball which is nothing but the hemispherical head of the humerus. It is also lined by hyaline articular cartilage. The head of the humerus, if you just compare it with the glenoid cavity, it is roughly three times the size of the glenoid cavity. The head of the humerus is three times bigger than the size of the glenoid cavity. As a result, the shoulder joint offers more mobility but at the expense of stability. So, if you expect more mobility, then you are going to lose your stability. So, that is a risk or complication of shoulder joint. Moving further. Any joint will be stable in its position only with the help of ligaments or other supports supporting the joint. So, stability of a joint is maintained by the ligaments holding the articulating parts of the joint together. So, here we have the fibrous capsule. Number 2, we have the glenohumeral ligaments. Number 3, we have the corcohumeral ligament and you have the transverse humeral ligament. In addition to these, you also have accessory ligaments that is coracoacromial ligament and coracoacromial arch. This coracoacromial arch plays a very vital role in preventing the upward dislocation of the shoulder joint. It is supposed to form the secondary socket or secondary ligament supporting the shoulder joint. Going on to the fibrous capsule, the first ligament of the shoulder joint, it forms the outermost covering of the shoulder joint. It is very loosely attached. All around the joint is loosely attached so, the shoulder joint can go in for free movements. Proximally, it is attached to the margins of the glenoid cavity, even proximal to the attachment of glenoidal labrum. It encloses the origin of long head of biceps brachii muscle. Distally, it is attached to the anatomical neck of the humerus, except inferiorly where it extends below for about 1.25 centimeters up to the surgical neck of the humerus. To repeat, the fibrous capsule forms the loose outer covering of the shoulder joint. It is very loosely attached, so it can allow free movements of the shoulder joint. Proximally, it is attached to the margins of the glenoid cavity, proximal to the attachment of the glenoidal labrum. Here, it allows or has an opening for the origin of long head of tendon of biceps muscle to come out of the joint cavity. Distally, it is attached to the anatomical neck of the humerus except inferiorly where the fibrous capsule attachment extends 1.25 centimeters below up to the surgical neck of the humerus. The synovial membrane lines the inside of the capsule. Shoulder joint is a synovial joint, so obviously the capsule of the shoulder joint is lined on its inner surface by the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane is reflected from the capsule onto the non-articular intracapsular part of the humerus. 
it forms a tubular sheath as well for the long head of the tendon of biceps brachii muscle to come out of the joint cavity. Weakness of the capsule. Having said so much about the capsule, the capsule does not offer really a very strong support to the joint because it is loosely attached for the reason it has to allow free movements of the joint. So, whenever free movements are made possible, the stability is lost. So, the shoulder joint therefore has more mobility but at the expense of stability. Openings in the capsule. The capsule presents with three openings on its surface. Number one is between the tubercles of the humerus for the tendon of long head of biceps muscle to come out because this tendon has an intracapsular origin. So, it has to come out of joint cavity. So, it passes through the opening through the capsule between the two tubercles of the humerus. On the anteromedial side, there is another opening through which the joint cavity communicates with the subcapsular bursa. On the posterolateral side, there is another opening through which the joint cavity communicates with the infraspinatus bursa. Rotator cuff, otherwise known as a cordman's musculotendinous cuff, actually it is a muscular support. It is a muscular uh, blending of four muscles. The tendons of four muscles blend with the capsule to form a very strong support for the shoulder. If this rotator cuff had not been there, then all of us would go in for frequent dislocations of shoulder. The laxity and weakness of the capsule is compensated by the expansions of the following tendons which cross the shoulder joint to reach the sites of insertion. The muscles that go to form the rotator cuff will be anteriorly subscapularis, superiorly supraspinatus, posteriorly infraspinatus and teres minor. So, these muscles together forming the rotator cuff or cordman's musculotendinous cuff form one of the most important factors for the stability of shoulder joint. These tendons blend well with the fibrous capsule of the shoulder joint as they cross the joint and travel towards the sites of insertion. And there is no muscle supporting inferiorly, hence the weakest part of the capsule is the inferior part of the shoulder joint. Coming to the other ligaments of shoulder joint which support the shoulder joint, Glenohumeral ligament attachments, proximally it is attached to the upper end of the anterior border of glenoid fossa. Distally it splits into three bands, superior, middle and inferior. The superior is attaching to the upper part of the lesser tubercle. The middle is attaching to the lower part of the lesser tubercle. The inferior is attaching to the shaft of the humerus even below the lesser tubercle. This is about the glenohumeral ligament. Next we move on to the next ligament, transverse humeral ligament. So, transverse humeral ligament stretches between the two tubercles of the humerus. So, that is the greater tubercle and the lesser tubercle. So, stretching in between you have the transverse humeral ligament. It forms a nice gap, comfortable gap for the tendon of long head of biceps to pass deep to it. It helps to hold the tendon in position during the various movements of the shoulder joint. Coracohumeral ligament. It is attached to the lateral margin of the coracoid process to the greater tubercle of the humerus. So, that is the coracohumeral ligament. Coracoacromial arch which we mentioned earlier as a secondary socket of shoulder joint. The coracoacromial arch has made a paw has the coracoacromial arch. The coracoacromial arch as we have already mentioned is a secondary socket for the shoulder joint. It is made up of three components two bony components and one ligamentous component. The two bony components are the coracoid process of scapula, the acromion process of scapula and the intervening or interconnecting ligamentous component known as coracoacromial ligament. The coracoacromial ligament is a triangular band stretching from the coracoid process tip to the lateral margin of the one second. The coracoacromial ligament is a ligamentous band which is triangular in shape stretching between the tip of the acromion process to the lateral margin of the coracoid process. Moving on to bursae, bursae are small pockets around the joint mainly to act as shock absorbing structures to support the joint all around the joint. The, sh the shoulder joint is supported by six such bursae namely subscapular bursa, infraspinatus bursa, subcoracoid bursa, subacromial bursa which is the longest bursa on the body, bursa above the coracoid process, bursa on the upper surface of acromion process. So, here you can make out most important bursae that is the subacromial bursa. Subacromial bursa or subdeltoid bursa which is the longest bursa on the body which can be seen in this image as well. 
coming to relations of the shoulder joint all around it. Superiorly, it is supported by middle fibers of deltoid, supraspinatus, subacromial bursa and coracoacromial arch. Inferiorly, it is supported by the long head of the triceps muscle, axillary nerve and posterior circumflex humeral vessels. Anteriorly, it is related to the anterior fibers of deltoid, subscapularis, coracobrachialis and short head of biceps. Posteriorly, it is related to posterior fibers of deltoid, infraspinatus and teres minor. So, these are the relations of shoulder joint all around it. Coming to vessels and nerves related, the axillary nerve and posterior circumflex humeral vessels wind around the surgical neck of the humerus. So, this is the surgical neck of the humerus where the axillary nerve and the posterior circumflex humeral vessels wind around the surgical neck. So, this uh, relationship between the nerve vessels and the surgical neck is very important because when a head of the shoulder slips downwards, it can impinge upon the axillary nerve and posterior circumflex humeral vessels and result in consequent seculae. So, these wind around the surgical neck of humerus in intimate contact with the inferior part of the capsule of shoulder joint. You can make out the axillary nerve and the posterior circumflex. So, you can make out the axillary nerve and the posterior circumflex humeral vessels here. Blood supply and innovation. The arteries supplying the shoulder joint are suprascapular artery, anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries, circumflex scapular branch of subscapular artery. The nerves are lateral pectoral nerve, posterior division of axillary nerve and suprascapular nerve. Coming to muscles and muscles producing the various movements. Coming to movements and muscles producing the movements in the region of shoulder joint. Moving on to the movements of shoulder joint and the muscles producing them. There is a whole set of movements possible at the shoulder joint. Flexion, extension, medial rotation, lateral rotation, adduction, full abduction above the head. One full round, this is circumduction. To repeat the movements once again, flexion, extension, medial rotation, lateral rotation, adduction, abduction, above the head, one full round circumduction. So, these are the movements of shoulder joint. Now, let us see what are the muscles producing them. Now let us see what are the muscles producing these various movements. Flexion is produced by pectoralis major, anterior fibers of deltoid, coracobrachialis and biceps brachii. Extension is produced by posterior fibers of deltoid and teres major. Medial rotation is produced by again anterior fibers of deltoid, pectoralis major, teres major, latissimus dorsi and subscapularis. Lateral rotation is brought about by infraspinatus, teres minor and posterior fibers of deltoid. Adduction is made possible by deltoid, pectoralis major, subscapularis, teres major, coracobrachialis and long head of triceps. Abduction is initiated by supraspinatus muscle. Supraspinatus can abduct the shoulder up to 15 degrees. Further abduction is brought about by the middle fibers of deltoid muscle. So, abduction is started by supraspinatus muscle to initiate. It is otherwise known as initiator of abduction of shoulder joint up to 15 degrees. Further abduction is made possible by deltoid muscle. The supraspinatus holds the head of the humerus in contact with the glenoid cavity of scapula. Circumduction is a full round where the upper limb completely makes one circle. It is a sequence of flexion, abduction, extension and adduction or in the reverse rotation. What is scapulohumeral rhythm? Whenever the shoulder joint is moving, it is not only that the head that is moving within the shoulder joint, there is also a rotation of scapula that is being brought about. Up to 30 degrees, abduction involves predominantly the shoulder joint alone. But when abduction moves from 30 degrees to 180 degrees over the head, then abduction involves both shoulder joint and scapular rotation. For every 2 degree movement in the shoulder joint, there is a 1 degree movement in scapula and this rhythm is called as scapulohumeral rhythm. 
this rhythm has to be maintained for abduction to be smooth around the shoulder joint. So, scapulohumeral rhythm is one where for every 2 degree movement in the shoulder joint, there is 1 degree movement in scapula. So, during abduction, there is also a rotation of scapula going on simultaneously. So, that is how it is occurring the scapulohumeral rhythm, especially during abduction from 30 to 180 degrees. What are the factors influencing the stability of shoulder joint? These can be categorized as muscular support, ligamentous support, splints and cartilaginous support. The muscular support is offered by rotator cuff and supraspinatus tendon. The ligamentous support is by glenohumeral ligament, coracohumeral ligament, coracoacromial arch. These will support the upper part of the shoulder joint forming suprahumeral support. The splints will be long head of triceps and the long head of biceps which act like splints below and above the joint respectively. Cartilaginous support is offered by glenoidal labrum which is a fibrocartilaginous ribbon that helps to deepen the glenoid cavity. Applied anatomy, we have most important condition, clinical condition known as supraspinatus tendinitis. There is impingement of supraspinatus tendon on the acromion process during abduction movements which can lead to tendinitis or inflammation of the supraspinatus tendon. There is diminished vascularity which can aggravate the condition. Calcium deposition can further irritate, can cause irritation and burning sensation which can result in subacromial bursitis also. So, you can see the inflamed supraspinatus tendon in a condition of supraspinatus tendinitis. The next condition is painful arc syndrome. Abduction anywhere between 60 degrees to 120 degrees results in severe acute pain. This clinical condition is known as painful arc syndrome. It usually occurs in males above 50 years of age due to unusual excessive use of shoulder for activities which we are not regularly used to doing. Dislocation of shoulder. We saw in the earlier session that shoulder joint is highly movable joint but at the expense of stability. So, shoulder joint since it is highly movable, definitely its stability is compromised. So, it is one of the joints which goes in for dislocations easily. The inferior part of the capsule is weak because there is no muscular or ligamentous support along the inferior aspect of the shoulder joint. Therefore, antero inferior dislocations of shoulder joint is common. The head of the humerus slips downwards and forwards and may press upon the vessels and brachial plexus in the axilla. What you see here is a normal shoulder articulation, anterior dislocation where the head slips anteriorly, posterior dislocation where the head slips posteriorly and the most common dislocation where the head has slipped inferiorly that is the inferior dislocation of shoulder. The inferiorly dislocated head can compress upon or impinge upon the vessels in the axilla namely the axillary vessels and the brachial plexus. Recurrent dislocation of shoulder in sport activities such as throwing baseball or football forcibly can cause a damage to glenoidal labrum, capsule and rotator cuff of the shoulder. When this is not corrected properly, it can result in recurrent dislocations of shoulder joint antero inferiorly as we all know that there is lack of support in the antero inferior aspect of shoulder joint. Surgery would be the best mode of treatment for this condition. Axillary nerve damage occurs in antero inferior dislocations as mentioned earlier. The slipped head from the glenoid cavity can compress upon the axillary nerve downwards and it can result in injuries to the structures. Axillary nerve damage occurs in antero inferior dislocations of shoulder joint. The slipped axillary nerve damage can occur in antero inferior dislocation of shoulder joint. The slipped head of the humerus can compress upon the structures in the axilla namely the axillary nerve and due to which there will be a paralysis of deltoid muscle and loss of sensation over the skin covering the deltoid muscle. So, once the axillary nerve is damaged, the deltoid muscle is also paralyzed. So, abduction is not possible at the same time the patient loses sensation over the skin covering the deltoid region. Rotator cuff injury. Repetitive use of rotator cuff as in the case of sportsmen may result in an injury to the rotator cuff. This results in the humeral head and rotator cuff impinging on the coracoacromial arch. 
So when something is constantly impinging or rubbing against the coracochromial arch, the arch can go in for irritation and this further results in inflammation of the rotator cuff. Recurrent inflammation of rotator cuff causes shoulder pain and tearing of the rotator cuff. Injury to rotator cuff can further affect the stability of the joint as it forms one of the most important factors stabilizing the shoulder joint. So you can see here the tendon of supraspinatus muscle, the rotator cuff is there. So if this is injured that can result in a damage to the stability of the shoulder joint. Adhesive capsulitis is otherwise known as frozen shoulder commonly. It is caused by adhesive fibrosis or scarring of the capsular tissue. There is also scarring of rotator cuff, subacromial bursa and deltoid due to periarthritis. There is severe pain in the shoulder, there will be joint stiffness and restricted mobility. Because of pain, the patient does not move the shoulder joint. So there is restricted mobility as well occurring in the age group between 40 to 60 years commonly. So due to excessive pain in the shoulder and restricted mobility, there is disuse atrophy of the surrounding muscles in the shoulder region. So that is the inflamed joint capsule. A normal x-ray of the shoulder joint, x-ray shoulder joint AP view of the right side. You can make out the head of the humerus, you can make out the glenoid cavity because it is coracoid process, this is acromion process and that is the clavicle. So this is a normal x-ray of the shoulder joint AP view of the right side. Going back to the problem that we saw in the earlier part of this session. I repeat, a 54 year old man fell down from the stairs following which he developed excruciating pain over his right shoulder and was unable to move his affected shoulder. He was taken to the emergency room where he was examined and was subjected to x-ray which revealed loss of contour of his right shoulder. He was sitting in ER with his left hand supporting his right elbow so that his right shoulder should not move and he complained that there was loss of sensation in the lower half of deltoid region. Any attempt to move his injured shoulder was too painful for him. What is the likely diagnosis in this case? It is of course obviously it is a dislocation of shoulder joint on the right side. Why does it happen? It happens because one of the ligamentous or the muscular supports have been injured. When a support is lost, a joint goes in for dislocation. What is the most common type? in such dislocations. This condition is dislocation. So what is the commonest type of dislocation? Antero inferior dislocation of shoulder joint is a commonly occurring type. What is the cause of normal, what is the cause for, what is the cause of loss of normal contour of shoulder? Since the head of the humerus has slipped out of the joint cavity from the glenoid cavity downwards, so the rounded contour of shoulder has been lost. So that indicates the loss of contour of shoulder in the clinical case given above indicates that there is a dislocation of shoulder joint. What is the cause for loss of sensation in the lower half of deltoid region? The skin of the lower half of deltoid region is supplied by axillary nerve. So the slipped head may be in the axilla would have impinged or compressed upon the axillary nerve and that is why there is a loss of sensation in the lower half of the deltoid region. So we have gone through the case. In the earlier part of the session, we went through this session, now we have analyzed this case, we have resolved it, we have answered all these questions. Hope this session was useful. Looking forward to see you in another session like this. Thank you.